We just listened to the first two episodes of a new podcast, and we want to tell you all about it. The show is called Nobody Should Believe Me, and it's a groundbreaking investigation into Munchausen by proxy. Anyone who listens to Murder Sheet knows we really appreciate a deep dive into a subject. Well, no one has ever done anything of this depth and breadth on the topic before. You will be enthralled by the stories it tells, but even more importantly, you will learn a great deal about how to keep kids in your community safe from harm. But what makes this show different is that the host of the podcast, novelist Andrea Dunlop, has a uniquely personal connection to this subject. Someone close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy a while ago. So to her, this is not just something that happens to other people. Her personal story really gives this show an emotional punch. It also means she really makes an effort to get at the humanity of all of the people involved, all the victims and survivors. This isn't a podcast that focuses on the gruesome details. It has heart. Andrea really uses her storytelling skills to help us get to know the wide variety of people whose lives have been affected by Munchausen by proxy. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning. This episode contains description of violence against women, murder, and sexual assault. If you haven't done so already, please listen to last week's episode. It was part one of our look at the High's ice cream murder case. As a refresher, Connie Hevener and Carolyn Perry, two young employees at the High's in Stanton, Virginia, were found shot to death in the back of the store in 1967. Police focused their investigation on William Thomas, a witness who admitted he lied about what he had seen on the night of the murders. They ultimately charged him with one of the killings, but he was acquitted. Yet he knew that if they found more evidence, they could always charge him with the other murder. Let's go back in time to just before the murders, sometime in spring of 1967. A woman named Joyce Fielding went out for burgers with a woman who then went by the name of Diane Crawford. Diane worked at the hospital as a nurse's aide, and she also held down a job at High's Ice Cream Shop. In small-town Virginia of the late 60s, Diane was a bit unusual. Not only did she not have any boyfriends, but her choice of clothing didn't conform to the era's feminine standards. In terms of her personality, Diane could be hard to get along with. According to Joyce, Diane had a bit of a mean side. Now, sitting together in Diane's car, Diane asked Joyce to look in the glove compartment. Joyce did, and saw a gun. Diane called the gun her baby. She said she had two bullets. One was for her stepfather, and the other was for a girl she hated and wanted to get even with, the Hevener girl who lived on Grubert. Connie Hevener lived on Grubert, and, of course, she would soon after be shot to death in the back of the High's ice cream shop. And about a week after that, Diane would call Joyce with an urgent message. Keep your mouth shut. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenley. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, The Murder Sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout Season 1 to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're the murder sheet, and this is The High's Ice Cream Homicides, Part 2.
Joyce ignored the warning from Diane and went to the police with the story of what Diane had said to her in the car. The officer she spoke with was David Bocock, who was one of the two men running the High's ice cream investigation. Bullcock is a figure who looms large in this case. Though he was a longtime Stanton, Virginia police officer, Bullcock did not appear to be held in high regard by everyone at the agency. Former Chief Butch Wells, who used to work in the investigations unit with Bullcock, remembered him as being political. More than once, Wells recalled, Bullcock would ask about a case and learn that an arrest was imminent. Bullcock would then announce he was reassigning the case and request the file. The arrest would then never occur. The man's own stepdaughter also did not have a high opinion of his prowess as a police officer. She remembered Bocock would often brag about how much he could get away with on the job, regaling the family with tales of warrantless searches and his mistreatment of prisoners. Bocock's failings extended to his personal life, too. Even when he was married, Bocock engaged in sexual activities with a variety of women. Horrifyingly enough, he even allegedly tried to get sexual with his stepdaughter, at a time when the stepdaughter was living in the same house with Bocock and his wife. It is unclear how much, if any of this, Joyce knew when she approached Bocock with the story about Diane. She certainly did not know that the officer and Diane enjoyed an unusually close relationship. You see, Diane spent time at his farm, hunting birds. He gave her shooting lessons. They were friends. And they may have been even more. Some people whispered that Diane and Bilcock were lovers. But others suggested an even deeper, more personal connection. Diane was born to an unmarried woman at a time when Bocock was having sexual relationships with numerous women. It seems plausible that Diane could actually have been his daughter. And if that were the case, what must have gone through his mind when Joyce approached him with a story suggesting that the double homicide he was investigating could have been committed by his own child? Let's take a quick break from the murder sheet to tell you about a podcast investigating yet another unforgettable crime. The Orange Tree is a seven-part series about a 2005 homicide that happened near the University of Texas at Austin. The murder of 21-year-old Jennifer Cave, who was shot, dismembered, and left in a bathtub at her friend Colton Petoniak's apartment, continues to haunt the area to this day. Like the Burger Chef murders, this case features plenty of twists and turns, including Colton's flight to Mexico with another UT student, Laura Hall. Both were later convicted in connection with the crime, although Colton has continued to appeal his verdict and claim innocence. The business student turned convicted murderer now says that he doesn't even remember much about the night Jennifer died. The Orange Tree is reported on and produced by Haley Butler and Tanu Thomas, who were both seniors at the University of Texas when they started this project. Together, Haley and Tanu strive to piece together this tragic story in an in-depth podcast that features audio from courtroom scenes and interrogation rooms, prison phone calls, and exclusive interviews with both the perpetrators and the victim's family. You can binge all seven episodes of The Orange Tree today on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, back to the murder sheet. A couple of days after Joyce shared her story with Bocock, the officer reached out to her. He told her there was nothing to worry about, that Diane had been cleared of any involvement in the murders. She had even, he said, taken and passed a polygraph. And that wasn't all. Bullcock told Joyce they tested Diane's gun, and it definitely was not the murder weapon. So, he insisted, she clearly was not involved in the crime in any way. And then, as if the mention of her gun reminded him of something, he told Joyce that Diane practiced firing her weapon at his farm. She was, he said now, a crack shot. 
Joyce interpreted his words as a warning. She did not push for more information and did not share her story with other officers. Diane, meanwhile, not only moved out of the town, but also changed her name, becoming Sharon Smith. From here on out, we shall call her Sharon in this episode. Bocock went on concentrating all of his investigative energies on William Thomas Jr., the man who would ultimately be tried and acquitted of one of the murders. Forty years passed. And then, one afternoon, Joyce went to her yard sale and ran into Lowell Sheets, a local businessman who was known to be interested in the High's ice cream case. She took a chance and told him her story. Sheets took the tale seriously. He tracked down Sharon, who, by this time, had returned to the area. She was, however, quite ill in living in an assisted living facility, and her family did not expect her to ever recover sufficiently to be able to return to her own home. One afternoon in the summer of 2008, Sheets visited her. He quickly brought up the topic of the High's ice cream murders. The color drained from Sharon's face, and she tried to change the subject, mentioning an unrelated murder that had occurred in the area back in the 1950s. But Sheets persisted, concentrating on the High's case. He said there had been a lot of blood at the crime scene. Well, said Sharon, when you shoot someone in the face, there's a lot of blood. It almost sounded as if she might know that from personal experience. Sheets shared his information with police. They also went to the assisted living facility to see Sharon. In fact, they visited with her repeatedly. Sometimes the ill woman seemed confused, perhaps as a result of her pain medication. And other times she seemed lethargic, to drift in and out of consciousness. At one point, the investigators even went so far as to promise Sharon she would get no prison time if she cooperated with them. Eventually, their efforts paid off, and they succeeded in coaxing from her a full account of what happened on the night of the murders. According to Sharon, she dropped by the ice cream shop to let Connie know that she could not work for her the next night. This upset Connie. There was already quite a bit of bad blood between the girls. Sharon was a lesbian, and, according to Sharon, Connie and Carolyn teased and bullied her about it. She hated them for that. And now they were giving her grief over not being able to work the next night. It was simply too much. I was just pushed so far, said Sharon, and I just shot her, and that was it. All these years later, she couldn't even be sure who she shot first. She thought it was Carolyn. Connie saw the shooting from the doorway. You bitch, she said. And she rushed to Carolyn's side in an ultimately futile attempt to help her fallen sister-in-law. And then Sharon shot her too. She was now alone in the shop with two dying girls, and she didn't know what to do. Looking around, she saw the money Connie had been preparing to deposit at the bank. She grabbed it, perhaps thinking it might cause the police to conclude the girls had been shot in a robbery. Sharon rushed out of the store, got into her car, and drove around aimlessly, trying to figure out what her next step should be. Eventually, she ended up at Dave Bocock's farm. She didn't seem to know that he was one of the officers in charge of investigating the High's homicides. To her, Bocock's place was simply a safe haven. She told him what she'd done, that she'd shot and killed the girls. Bocock told her to give the gun to him, that he would take care of it. So she handed it over to him. She wasn't entirely sure what he did with it, but believed he put it in a metal box and buried it. Sharon then went on with her life, moving away, marrying, and starting a family. It is unclear what Bocock did. When Joyce came to him with the story about the gun in Sharon's car, we know that he dutifully mentioned it in his notes. He even indicated that he had gotten a search warrant for her car and her room, presumably to look for the gun. 
but there is nothing in the records to show that such a warrant was ever executed. And, as best as Sharon could recall, she simply gave the gun to him with no mention of a warrant. In any case, the police now believed and accepted Sharon's confession. On December 12, 2008, they arrested her and charged her with the murder of Connie Havener and Carolyn Perry. She was, however, immediately released on bond and allowed to remain at the assisted living facility. This resolution of a cold case, after over 40 years, made national news. One observer who followed the story with more than a casual interest was William Thomas Jr. Thomas, of course, had been the witness who gave false information to the police early on in the case, and he had subsequently become the focus of the investigation. Even after he was tried and acquitted for one of the murders, the police kept him in their crosshairs in the case talking to his friends and relatives about him in the hopes of getting some sort of information that would justify charging him in the other killing. On the surface, there's nothing wrong with that. Police investigate their suspects, and sometimes the people they look into turn out to be completely innocent. It is an expected part of the process. But, if you take Sharon at her word, something very different occurred in this case. Bocock one of the lead investigators in the case, knew almost immediately that the real killer was Sharon and not Thomas. By continuing to look into Thomas, Bocock was therefore knowingly choosing to harass an innocent man. That harassment had had a cost to Thomas, too. He had lost relationships and jobs after people learned he was a suspect in a murder. And so now he decided to seek a remedy. He could not sue Bocock or his estate. The man was dead, and his estate had been liquidated. But Thomas felt that ultimately the responsibility for what happened lay with the city of Stanton itself. The city had hired Bocock to be a part of their law enforcement apparatus. They had trained him. They had promoted him to positions of authority within the department. So, in Thomas's view, they bore the blame for Bocock's bad actions. He filed a lawsuit against them, asking for $200 million. Unfortunately for Thomas, the courts did not agree with his reasoning. They dismissed his case. Thomas got no compensation for his ordeal. We tried to reach Thomas ourselves, to get his perspective on being a suspect in a brutal double homicide for decades. But we failed to get a hold of him. By the time Bocock's bad acts were exposed, he was dead and beyond the reach of justice. He suffered no punishment whatsoever for covering up for a murderer or for hounding a man he knew was innocent. He also could offer no insights or explanations on whatever motivated him. Was he a garden variety corrupt cop who just bent the law to protect a friend? Or was he a flawed man who betrayed his oath to try to save a girl he believed was his daughter? Or was there another explanation? Is it at all possible that Sharon was just an old lady on her deathbed trying to get the cops to leave her alone? That she said what she thought they wanted to hear? Was some of what she said not true? Could Bocock have been falsely maligned in all this? We don't have any of those answers, for sure. All we can say is that most of the major players in this are dead and Bocock's family will not cooperate with the DNA testing that could prove or disprove if Sharon was his child. So all we can do is speculate. Sharon died at the assisted living facility on January 19th, 2009. That is exactly where she would have died if she had never been charged. In short, she paid no real penalty or cost for the young lives she had taken 40 years earlier. Considering all of this, it is difficult to feel that any justice was done in this case, not for the victims and not for William Thomas. We feel nothing but gratitude for the efforts of citizen sleuth Lowell Sheets, who ultimately brought a resolution to this case, but we feel mystified as to why his efforts were even needed. The information given to him was sitting in police files for decades, ignored, 
and law enforcement has far more resources than Lowell Sheets does. Even allowing for the corruption of David Bocock, this lead should have been found and run down years ago, at a time when both Sharon and Bocock could have potentially paid a price for their crimes. The whole frustrating situation is certainly a good advertisement for legislation that forces law enforcement to publicize at least some files after a cold case has laid dormant long enough. And also for agencies to invest in dedicated cold case squads, which could spend all their time looking over old files and running down new leads. This case also makes us wonder. We both have cold cases that are personally important to us. Perhaps you do too. Do the clues that could offer solution to those cases lie forgotten in case files the police stubbornly refuse to release? Either through corruption or innocent error, are police in those cases pursuing innocent parties while affording the guilty parties the time and leisure to die in their own beds? We will likely never know. But we do know that whether or not a haunting mystery gets solved should not depend on a witness randomly choosing to repeat her story to a citizen sleuth who just happens to give a damn. We first came across this case via the reporting of Lindsay Barnes and Courtney Stewart in The Hook. While doing our own research, we also found the coverage in the Stanton Newsleader to be enormously helpful. William Thomas's lawsuit against the city of Stanton is public record and makes for fascinating reading. In the suit, Thomas makes colorful claims about Stanton that we did not include because we could not confirm them. If you're interested, you can find it via Pacer. But, like last week, our primary source was a trove of several hundred pages of Stanton police records that the department kindly shared with us. We thank them again for their help. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.